You are listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Welcome to Scuderia F1, the podcast that's always up to speed with the latest Formula One news. Follow us on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Daly and Kevin Laramang. Good day, good night, and welcome back to Scuderia F1. Mark, our first review of the season, the Australian Grand Prix, took place Sunday, Australian time. That meant really late or early, depending on how you look at it, Saturday night for us in North America. And Mark, we were talking off air before the beginning of the show. Uh, You know what? It's great to see proper tires. It's great to see proper looking Formula One on a racetrack. Absolutely, Kevin. And just going to what you were saying about having it at a at a nice time, at least here on the West Coast in the Pacific time zone, I'm in Vancouver. It was on at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night. And, yeah. you know, I got I got a, I've got a young kids at home, so I'm not going out on a Saturday night at all. So if you can have a Formula One race scheduled for every Saturday night, I'm going to be a happy guy. But yeah, that's the difference with the East Coast. It was like 1 a.m. when it started. And I'm yeah. like, you know what? My DVR is working. I'm going to do so much. <laughs> quickly on my phone the start yep after we're live, like you know what i'm gonna keep the suspense for tomorrow i don't blame you it, it starts to get a little bit late but i i think that even if i had stayed up to watch uh, after midnight i think it would have been worth it and it, it was just great to get back to racing and it was great to see the cars in action uh, away from testing and all the, the the things that we've seen over the last couple of months and it was nice to see them actually racing up against one another and you're dead right the the cars look great they look aggressive with those the new lines on them the the, the styling and the wider tires they just look fantastic so we'll see over the next several races and of course over the the entire season if the new specifications, the new rules actually lend to more overtaking, there's been more things said by some of the drivers over the weekend. But all in all, I think for the first race of the year, I think it was it was a fairly decent race. No, I do uh, think it was a pretty decent race, Mark. When I looked at the last year, well, right, we were always like, it was always looking like no matter what, if unless a mechanical problem or an accident, an incident between Hamilton or Rosberg, it was always going to look Mercedes was going to be like not even close on straightaways or even in the corners. And as soon as Mercedes had clean air, they were gone this time around. As soon as the, uh, I want to say strategy mistake, but they had to pit early for Lewis Hamilton because Lewis, this is one of my points I'm going to touch on later. Lewis Hamilton was quick on the gun of not trusting the grip on his tire. And he was talking about it as soon as the warming lab was like, oh, there's no grip on the, the starting grid. There's no grip on the grid. And that led up to him not having confidence at all in the grip of his tires, which led for an early pit, which gave the opportunity for Vettel to overcut Hamilton and stay out. And having tires that were not degrading, were doing great performance, these soft tires, after 23 laps, continuing, continuing. And then a few laps later, he actually pits. But because of the time that he was able to continue to gain, having clean air at front, mixed with the uh, traffic that Hamilton did face, and he was right next to uh, Verstappen, behind Verstappen, and then... Vettel was able to come out in front of Verstappen, in front of Hamilton, and there was nothing Hamilton could do at that point to bridge that gap. Well, that's right. And it was uh, it was really interesting to watch when Vettel came out of the pits and back onto the track because you just knew it was going to be close. And boy, was it ever close. And that, that first half a lap, as Vettel was getting his tires up to full race temperature, when he was actually up to race speed, that, that for me was the most crucial time because you had Verstappen and uh, Lewis. And of course, Lewis had the fresher rubber um, compared to, to, to Max. But I thought if either of them is going to be able to make any sort of move 
it would come in that 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 first half a lap while Sebastian's just right out of the pits. And of course, after that half a lap, then Vettel was pulling away from Verstappen with ease. And I, I think for Lewis, that was the worst possible time he could have caught up to him was right at that time. But he went in, like you say, on lap 17, complaining of no grip in the tires. And it's interesting, too, because if you go back to the the actual start of the race, it was completely different from last year. The two Mercedes got away cleanly and well, actually, they all did. They actually made it through the entire yeah. corner without anybody coming together, which is a bit of a rare event in Formula One period. Uh, but it, it wasn't until later on that you could, w- once they sort of established themselves after the first lap or two, that you could tell that Lewis was pulling away a little bit, but Vettel was hanging in right with him with at about just under a second or so. And that entire time up until Lewis's pit stop, um, Vettel was basically hanging right on his gearbox. I think at one point he backed off to about a second and a half, but I think that was more a decision on on Vettel's part, just not to get too close and stay a little bit out of uh, Hamilton's uh, dirty air. But it was interesting, some of the aftermath and some of the comments that came out after the race, Total Wolf, the the, the Mercedes motorsport boss said and suggested that perhaps that uh, Lewis had overheated the tires because they were absolutely on the limit trying to pull away and open up a gap to Vettel and it just didn't happen you know what the feeling I had Mark all across the weekend but especially during the race concerning Hamilton he was quick to complain about his car quick to not be comfortable in a situation and I think that's because he's so used to winning in the last few years so used to to dominate that he almost feels like How dare you challenge me? Like, this is not supposed to happen. What do I do? I don't, he doesn't necessarily have the instinct to fight back, the instinct to do save your tire when you need to, because he didn't need to. So he was saving engines, saving tires, but not because he needed to, to finish the race, because he needed to, to have a more advantage in the last few years. Maybe this time around, being challenged by the speed of Vettel, not necessarily knowing how to deal with it or knowing, but he didn't access that part of his knowledge in a few years. So it's kind of like a, a great athlete coming out of college. That was always number one, always dominates always the time. And now back to reality when you start with the big boys again. So it kind of felt that way for Hamilton where he never really had that confidence and that ability to actually dominate in the race itself, in qualifying, it's qualifying. It's, it's, but the race itself, where it counts, where you get those points, Hamilton, even when he was first, never had that spark that we used to see in the Mercedes. Like There, there is doubts. Well, definitely. And that's a very good point that you make, Kevin, because I think over the last two to three years, Mercedes knew that they had the best car. So whatever happened during the race, it was almost them kind of reacting to what was happening on the track, maybe what was happening with the with a particular situation with one of their drivers, and they knew how to deal with it. And now not knowing whereabouts they compare to some of the other cars, maybe the Ferrari or the Red Bull, which is obviously going to be a natural rival to Mercedes. And to come out and then just not being able to shake Vettel in that opening 15, 16 laps there, I think was a, a real surprise for them. But it just goes to prove that Ferrari speed during winter testing was for real because that was the big question. There was suggestions that they were sandbagging it at Barcelona and they weren't really showing their their their, their hand entirely and and lifting off just so just to kind of throw a little bit of confusion and <laughs> and typical Formula One mind games into into the proceedings, but it did show that that they're for real. But it was kind of interesting too when you go back and, and look a, a little bit further back on the grid. You have Vettel who was obviously very quick and had no problem staying ahead or staying with Hamilton and then obviously staying in front of him later in the race. And then you had Kimi Raikkonen in the second Ferrari, who was also complaining that his first stint on the ultra soft tires just didn't deliver. He had a lot of understeer and his car didn't really come alive until he went in and pitted for the, for the soft tire. So a little bit of a, a difference between the two Ferraris, but it will be very interesting to see in two weeks when we get to Shanghai at the Chinese Grand 
Grand Prix and find out was, was this just a one off or is this the, the the real deal? Because if it is, then it, it's game on. We could be looking at a at a challenge uh, from Ferrari directly to Mercedes for the entire year. And wouldn't it be great if maybe Red Bull could get their act together? Because they, I don't know about you, but I found them very disappointing. Not not just yeah. Ricardo that had basically problems ever since I think he got off the plane in Melbourne, but for Stappen also, he was just kind of there, thereabouts, and didn't really do anything of note. I think we can clearly see there's already a hierarchy in Formula One. Ferrari, Mercedes, one, two, top four. There's a gap. There's Red Bull. There's a gap. Williams, for India, Toro Rosso, and maybe Renault, we'll see are in that gap then. But I do feel that for Red Bull, they're there because their car is better than the other ones behind them, not good enough to get to the ones behind in front of them. So they're kind of stuck in no man's land for now, and they're going to have a little bridge to, to to manage in front of them. So, But just to finish on Mercedes, you know, the last few years, it was their races to lose. What they had to do is not screw up enough to make them lose the race. Now they might have to start winning races again. There's a difference. Yeah, definitely. And that that's a very good point. And th- they're going to have to work for it. And I think that is something, not that they didn't work for it before, but I, I think that's... a different mentality, right? Yes. They were almost defensive about it. Now you have to put the defensiveness, defensive attitude out the window and learn how to maybe approach a race with the knife in your teeth approach a race where who more knows aggressively. might not be the the, the favorite yeah, they, they might have to be more aggressive. And I think that it's interesting that that their pit strategy worked better than, say, uh, Mercedes did. Although, you know, Total Wolf did say that it was down more to pace rather than their strategy itself <laughs> that, that cost them that. the race. But, and, and that was. Second. It's a one second difference. And you know where that second was one? The pit stop. Yep. 2.2 or 2.3 for Vettel. It was like 3.2 for Hamilton. That second would have put Hamilton in front of Vettel when Vettel came out of his stop, but it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, and that that's a that's yeah, that's so true, right? I mean, you, you think about all these different factors that go into a Formula One race and all, all the things that go into the car, and then it it can come down to something as simple as a pit stop. Not that a, I'm suggesting a pit stop is a straightforward okay. or simple affair, but th- a that's, simple second would be what about 400 meters on the track? One yeah, second about is that, that about four, four for fifty. Because so Vettel I, came out, what, maybe a car length, a car length and a half in front of Max Verstappen? It wasn't much, was it? No, it was literally, if he didn't come out now, he would have had to wait to let the other two yield. He would have to yield if he didn't come out like a, that, that exact moment that he did. Yeah, and the, the other thing that really caught my attention on that pit stop of Hamilton's is that over the last couple of years, it seems that when it, when it came down to, say, head-to-head between Rosberg and Hamilton, it was always Hamilton seemed to get the slightly quicker stop, and, and it always seems like his were like the, the real, like the, the ones that were like in the real low numbers. So to see like one that's like 3.2 seconds, that's almost unheard of uh, for, for Mercedes. They don't really get them that slow all that often, but that's it really slow. made the difference. And then, well, it's Hamilton, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's still, it, it's mind boggling to think that you can get a group of mechanics around a car like that and, and, and change all four tires in just a couple of seconds. Uh, it just, I don't need, I can't even get in and out of my car in three seconds, let alone even I can't think of get the, up off my chair in three seconds. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just put it all in, it's dark reality, right? But yeah, it, it really made the, the, the whole difference. But, you know, I think that the other thing that was frustrating for Hamilton was that that Verstappen himself didn't stay out that much longer after the Vettel stop. So, but that really didn't make too much of a difference because Hamilton wasn't really that far behind Vettel at that point, but he just wasn't able to reel him in. And they, they kind of hit traffic at the same time. I mean, it wasn't like uh, Vettel was half a minute up up the road. So uh, as soon as he dealt with uh, some back mark, it wouldn't be too long before Lewis would have had to deal with them. So he just wasn't really ever able to pull him in. And it wasn't so much for me in the end that he was not able to challenge Vettel for the lead because I, I think Seb won by what, about nine or 10 seconds thereabouts in the end. But it was more that he was only about a... S- pardon me? Yeah. 
9975. 9 okay there you go. It, but it, it wasn't so much that he was 10 seconds behind uh, Seb but it was he was only about a second and a half in front of Valtteri Bottas who I thought we should probably talk about right now who I thought had a very good debut for for Mercedes. I think that for me that was one big question that well how how good is this guy going to be if he's going to be a Mercedes? Obviously he's going to be pretty good or else he's not going to be be there to begin with but if he's not going to be, say, the number one guy, and obviously Hamilton is that number one guy, he's going to be there to help do what, say, mm-hmm. Rosberg did. I mean, because it's for them, it's all about winning and dominating and and winning titles and constructors championships and all those things. So he's got to deliver the best finish that he can. So I thought a, a third place and, and basically right behind Lewis Hamilton was a, a pretty decent result for him. It is a very decent result. Uh, yes, he was off the pace a little bit during qualification and the few training sessions before that. But when it counts the most and during the race itself, Botas got better. He re- it seems like he remembered when he was on the grid, you know what? I've been doing this for a few years. I've been here <laughs> before. Actually, I was on the podium in 2014. Like I've had some success. So, and the, apparently his work with his... Uh, if the engineer is going very well, they have a great relationship. His engineer, which his name escapes me now, and it'll take me too long to find it anyways. So, but Valtteri Bottas' engineer, which used to work with Rosberg before for years, and Rosberg was the only F1 driver that engineer worked with. Valtteri Bottas now is establishing a new con- a new connection. And it's basically a first go around, a first full weekend with the new relationships, the new communication, uh, maybe lack thereof, with new people you're not used to work with you don't know what their instincts what their uh, their go-to move are going to be how they assess a situation when they mean it's an emergency is it truly an emergency all those little details that you need to size up in a relationship basically that you need to understand each other correctly like it, it's not there yet it's their first weekend and they have a great podium both us like close to hamilton getting closer to Hamilton and not just at the end of the race, though, Mark. Throughout the race, too, at the beginning, he was putting uh, pressure and he was coming back. And when Hamilton had 1.5 on Vettel, uh, uh, Bottas was actually gaining on Vettel. and Bottas was going to be a potential threat for Vettel. So there's a lot of positive for Mercedes outside of the win. But we talked a lot about for Mercedes. I think we haven't talked about Ferrari enough where... Sebastian Vettel, did you notice how in shape, how fit he does look in the post-game commentary and a few different interviews that I've seen about him after the race? He looks about 15 pounds lighter than last year. And that, I am sure it is not a coincidence with, uh, with the motivation aspect. I, I think he saw an opportunity and I think he kind of figured out a few weeks ago a few months ago, that we're going to have a pretty decent car. I actually have to come prepare. I can really fold it in this year. Well, that, yeah, that's interesting, right? And I, I think that we all, we all know that the silly season in Formula One regarding the drivers starts earlier and earlier every year. However, I don't think I've ever heard of a silly season starting basically a year and a half before the season that it's it's really focusing on. And I'm thinking about 2018 in particular. When it came out last year that that uh, both Vettel and say Alonso are out of contract at Ferrari and Mercedes, or sorry McLaren, I'm, I'm sure Alonso would love to be in a Mercedes, but that maybe that's a bit of a slip. Anyways, the point is that that Seb only has one year left at at Ferrari, and uh, Maurizio Arriva Bene said a couple of times last year that there was no guarantees who's going to be there, and even ha- Seb has to work to earn a contract at Ferrari. So perhaps he had a little bit of a wake up call obviously there was a lot of things going on at ferrari last year and perhaps just like you say he realized all of a sudden okay well we we've got a really good car and we we've got a legitimate chance to win here and this this thing looks looks for real so it's it is interesting to see how how fit he does look and i was thinking something similar that he didn't look quite so pudgy in the cheeks you know he just he just looks slimmer and uh it's a double chin it wasn't there's no double chin this year like uh the jawline is very defined 
Yeah, and I, I think, well, obviously Seb is a multiple world champion. He's won, what, five is it in total? So, I mean, obviously he's one of the best drivers on, on the grid there. So we know that he can get it done. And it was great to see that that Ferrari just it seemed like they'd kind of broken out of their funk. I mean, it'd been what a year and a half since they won their last race at Singapore in 2015. So they, they were do a win. I mean, they, they obviously, I don't think they deserved to last year, 2016. They just, they just weren't good enough, but it is, uh, it will be interesting to watch as, as we move forward here. What's interesting to watch is we don't know who's going to win. Okay. We have maybe a pool of choices, uh, maybe a four, but still, they're one of those four who could win at any given time. And again, the, the, the Lewis Hamilton, not lose necessarily motivation, but lose that killer instinct. Like last year, it was a, a tough battle with Nico Rosberg that he lost because we forget that Rosberg is a champion, but he retired. So bye bye, Nico. Nobody talks about Nico anymore. And that's fine. So Lewis, you kind of feel like. Does he know what to do in a certain situation? And I'm going to talk about design now. We clearly saw a few things this weekend. Different cars look they like all look a little bit different. It's funny how at Melbourne, like cars all look a little bit different. And throughout the season, slowly but surely, they start to look a little more similar. Like everybody picks up on whatever everybody else did and they start to look similar. The way the Ferrari, I haven't pinpointed the reason yet. And I'm going to have to look closely add to some blown up picture of the FP78. But for Ferrari, this time around, it seemed like in traffic, it holds up pretty well. It seems like that Ferrari can get pretty close to the car in front of him when they're not first. And, well, we saw it in clean air. It can hold off, at least it could have, hold off the McLaren, the Mercedes. So, uh, this might be very positive. And in traffic right now, I don't know outright which one is the best car. But in traffic, Ferrari is better than Mercedes right now. Yeah, I, I don't even know if Ferrari or Mercedes uh, know which or who has the better car. Ferrari's Jock Clear even said that for them it was a bit yeah. of an unknown. And it, just because the way that the race unfolded, no doubt they were the better, they had the better, the, the faster car on the day. Obviously, uh, Seb didn't have the problems that uh, that Lewis Hamilton had with his tires. And and so we'll see. Shanghai might be interesting. It, it might, we'll, we'll probably need three or four races to really get a good feel on on who's where and, and, and really get a pulse on the season. But I was just uh, thinking as you were talking about uh, Nico Rosberg and, and Lewis Hamilton that, that perhaps maybe Lewis needed Nico a little bit more than maybe he would care to admit to himself. Maybe not so much that he just liked having the guy around because obviously that relationship was pretty tense and maybe even a little bit toxic at times. But I think that that animosity that they had when it was sort of that that peak rivalry between them, I, th- I think that helped uh, Lewis, because it, it seemed that his whole thing was just to try and put uh, Rosberg in his place and just prove <laughs> you're not better than me. I'm Lu- Lewis Hamilton. Who, who the hell are you? You're Nico Rosberg. So, uh, and then you you hear some of the things that he was saying after Botas joined the team, and he's like, "Oh, he's the best teammate I've ever had. He's such a great pro and stuff like that." I'm just like, I don't know if if, if this is the kind of relationship that uh, that that Lewis really needs. I think he needs that he needs that bit of animosity, that little bit of hatred, like he had with Rosberg, really to to get that little bit of extra out of him and just just prove that he is the best driver. Two possibilities that could be awesome. Sebastian Vettel teammate to Lewis Hamilton in a red car, in a silver car, whatever, in the future, if it's even possible. That could be interesting. Two world champion, two outspoken in their own way drivers. It's not always polished when it comes from Sebastian. Sometimes it's a little bit raw. Sometimes it's a little bit not PG. But <laughs> Lewis Hamilton, you do have a more polished thought Sometimes not fully disclosed, like it's not full disclosure, but like Lewis said, he never lies. He might not tell anything, might not say anything, but he doesn't lie. And you know what? A few weeks ago, he mentioned, I kind of think Ferrari are quicker than they let on to be. And you know what? He wasn't lying. No, he wasn't. And it's funny, too, that uh, that you should say that, because I, I think that Lewis, he always has 
he always says the right thing. It's almost, he, he takes that, that half a second to think of what he's going to say before he says it. And it, it's always, it's, it's interesting how he always puts in words and, and phrases his statements. And I mean, yeah, he doesn't lie, but he always puts that kind of twist on it. I think he always likes to do, let his driving do the talking, but yeah, <laughs> we'll see though, right? If, if things continue like they did and say that, uh, that Melbourne isn't an outlier and it, we see in a couple of weeks after China that that they're second uh, to Ferrari once again, and perhaps who knows? Maybe they get it right because uh, Kimi Raikkonen said they know what they need to do in in the future. They they know what some of the problems were. So let's say that Ferrari has two competitive cars at Shanghai, and say they manage to come home in a one-two, and say say this is something that starts to repeat itself. Like how how is Lewis going to react to that? Are we going to see any frustration? Is he is he going to get to like for Fernando Alonso levels <laughs> of, of well, frustration, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But or McLaren, uh, you know what? We kind of anticipated it, but it was uh, uh, almost as bad as anticipated. Thirteen and fourteenth, and Alonso gets uh, beat by Van Dorn, but they're all like they didn't finish. Uh, Van, did Van Dorn finish? I think he was the last driver to finish. I think third. Yeah, Van Dorn finished yeah. uh, 13th and only two third. laps, two laps down or, or something in the, in that neighborhood. And that's correct. Yeah. Well, it was interesting some of the things that uh, Alonso was saying too, because he was, I think he had a pretty good uh, qualifying session, but he was pretty candid after the race. And he was saying that, okay, well, Melbourne was pretty good and he was happy that he was running as high as he was. I think he got up to about 10th at, uh, at, at, the, at the best point to the race and then he he retired uh, because of a suspension problem and of course Alonso being Alonso nowadays he doesn't seem to really hold back at all and he said well yeah it was it was a good weekend for us due in large to a good qualifying but based on on what they've seen and what they have right now that if it was any other circuit that they'd be running at the back which that's a bit yeah. of a mind blower but I mean yeah he had the suspension problem but the one thing then that, that Fernando said that I, I did really sort of catch my attention was that he, he said that even though that they were in a fuel saving mode and he had the suspension problem that that cost him his race and then van doren just he had all sorts of electrical gremlins or god only knows what uh, basically right from the 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 green lights well he had to shut down and restart the car at one time where he was in the pit lane and he was losing the count so he was losing the count of his transmission so he had to count himself going up and going down going up it usually fixes itself and you can never really miss one but going down is the problem if you're having some little gearbox problem or just communication from the gearbox to your display your your heads up display then it can be difficult when you have to do the own calculation and not miss one and not double double click one or or that aspect for van doren mixed with his first race for mclaren so so a lot of a new environment for van doren on his first race but for mclaren what alonso said in the same interview that you mentioned was interesting to me 200 meters they lose 200 meters on any given straightaways so if that that's totally due to the engine and now on does quite open saying look we're, we're actually working on a brand new engine 100 percent, and it's going to be ready in two months so you might have mclaren upgrades in two months but you know they had two go around to this this is the second engine they produce in the partnership of the last two years and it's a flop again well the third time be the charm i don't like that expression and you know what going with history it won't so <laughs> what do you do well that's right and yeah the, basically what, uh, what what honda is saying is that they've admitted that they have a lack of power and what they need to do is that they have to raise the combustion efficiency of the engine but to do that they basically have to redesign the hardware on the power unit to do so so you can imagine that everybody at the the honda design office and the engineers and all the designers and then the people that are going to build this 
everything are basically going to be working 24 seven because, uh, Yusuke Hasegawa, the, the, the Honda F1 chief said that he expects a fix to be on the car in time for Monaco. And well, Monaco is at the end of May, basically two months from right now. So that's a lot of work. And I mean, you know, it, it just seems so, it, it just doesn't seem logical. I mean, it doesn't even matter if it's it's Formula One, but uh, we were, we were talking just um, in, in Major League Soccer terms when Real Salt Lake they they fired their coach last week three three games into the new season, and this is kind of almost a similar thing for for Honda. I mean they're they're redesigning their engine after one race and a disastrous winter testing session. It just kind of it, it sort of strikes me. Okay, well. Why are you at this point now? Shouldn't this have all been sorted out before you got to the winter testing? If you you knew you had this lack of power, shouldn't these 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 things been worked out and the solution already well underway to being implemented on the car? It just seems wow. You know, you're, you're looking at this. I mean, you're going to write off perhaps the next couple of races before Monaco. You would think so. You would think it'd be a problem that would be addressed, but you know, it, it's a. Uh, a, a culture problem in the company. Uh, Honda is not the type of company that will go by and hire Adrian Newey. Uh, it's just an example here. I know Adrian Newey is not going to be the one who designed the engine per se, but okay, so uh, but it can work with the example. You get Adrian. They're not going to go get Adrian Newey. They're going to try to get the knowledge to either somebody that they already have employed or from the university, from their uh, their factory of brains factories of higher executive directors and right now that's not working so get that golden bridge go get somebody with the knowledge go get somebody that knows how to build a hybrid motor in formula one that is powerful and successful need do what you need to do because within the company itself i don't think the knowledge the efficiency the way to treat an F1 engine like it's supposed to be in this hybrid era, they're not up to par. No, they're not. And it's a, it's a, a very interesting observation that you make. And I was uh, reading Ross Braun's book, Total Competition, that came out just before Christmas. And he he talks about the the days with uh, with Honda, and also he made some uh, some comparisons to Toyota that there just were, there wasn't a Formula One culture within those teams. And apparently at at Honda, that still appears to be the case because I think it, what was it Eric Boulier said something similar. I think I don't don't think it was Zach Brown, but it was one of the McLaren, uh, you know, one of one of their big wigs that said something similar that Honda just does not have the the Formula One culture or the culture necessary to win in Formula One, and that just really astounded me and then of course those rumors that were coming out last week that perhaps uh, Mercedes and McLaren are talking about uh, a potential engine supply deal but if you're Honda that's got to scare the hell out of you because you you've got to think that you have a, a deal in place with McLaren who you have a successful relationship with going back to the late 80s early 90s when that was the package to have was a McLaren with a Honda engine in the back and to think that they could potentially have that partnership revoked because uh, McLaren have this um, this clause in the contract to break that arrangement as early as this year that, they, that they've got to be doing absolutely everything that they can to deliver the goods because they're not going to, to lose uh, face and, and to, just the, the, the negative PR of, of losing that deal with McLaren and looking as bad as they do. No, that's absolutely right. But if you are McLaren, though, what you want is not that you does you don't want Honda per se. It's not even that far in the thinking. You need horsepower. Give me horsepower. Put more horses under my figurative hood, and then maybe I'll go faster, and we can start talking. That's literally what McLaren needs right now. So whatever the case may be. Getting Honda to finally do what they need to do to break that contract, get a Ferrari, get a Mercedes, a Renault, I don't know. Whatever needs to be done, they need horsepower. 
Yeah, and, and of course, it's not only potentially the 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 engines that's the, the 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 problem, but they may lose one of the best drivers in Fernando Alonso because if they don't have a good season, he's out of contract with McLaren at the end of the year, and you know what, he could be on to someone else and say, you know what, guys, I came here in good faith a couple of years ago when I was at Ferrari and things weren't exactly to my liking there, and everything sounded great and the potential sounded fantastic to come back to McLaren. But you know what? It's not only has it not been good, it's actually been pretty bad. So I'm just going to take my chances and pretty much, I mean, you got to think that Fernando is going to have his pick of any of the available seats for, for 2018, yeah. but uh, maybe if there's a, a, a lot of brand new prospect that we're not expecting that are having a spectacular season and, other places and decide to join F1 next year. That's maybe the case and youth can be interesting. That leads me to a new segment of Scuderia F1, Mark, where we will do every show. It's called Taking a Stroll with Lance. Hey, there you go. I love the title. <laughs> Let's stroll. Our Canadian boy, first time in 11 years, we have a Canadian driver in Formula One succeeding to the one and only world champion Jacques Villeneuve Lance Stroll it wasn't easy for Lance it wasn't the best possible race in result and didn't finish uh, finish uh, he was up to 13th before he started having brake issues but you know at one point in the start where he did start the last he was up to 14 after the first turn like the kid was at the right place at the right time because it was a little further he was able to see the opening when some uh, drivers got too close and slowed down. He was taking advantage of that, got to 14th, did a nice run, uh, overtook a few drivers, had some problem, came into pit, come out, two pit stops still. Uh, the car is not necessarily as reliable that he would like, and the way he drove the car on the first day might lead to some problem because of lack of experience, and that's a possibility with those very complicated and intricate, electronically built, basically, at Formula 1. But for Lance, it's a deception, yes. But he did show some promise. He was able to hold on world champions like Alonso. He was able to uh, do some great performance on the track. So add a little bit of weeks of experience, had him some comfort, some be able to find his bearings into this car, give him half a season, I wouldn't be surprised if he's close to top 10 week in, week out. Yeah, and uh, I think that he did pretty good. I mean, all things considering, I mean, he hit the wall in qualifying and he had to change his gearbox, which put him back to, what was it, 20th on the grid to start the race. But I thought yeah. he acquitted himself well. And at the end there, when he was off on the grass, I was thinking, oh boy, there you go. Maybe just a little bit of inexperience and just maybe not have been able to adapt to these these new monster cars that they have in Formula One. But, you know, I'll have to eat a little bit of crow because it turned out that he had a brake failure. So, uh, I'll have to say mea culpa to, to Lance uh, for, for that one. But yeah, I mean, you look at him, I mean, he's in a Williams and say compare that to Max Verstappen when he joined Formula One a couple of years ago. He started out with a, with a Toro Rosso and obviously that there's going to be a little bit of a difference between a Toro Rosso in 2015 compared to a Williams of two years ago. So, you know, he's got a very powerful engine in the back and I mean, he's getting used to everything and I'm, of course he's only only 18. So you got to give the guy a, a benefit of the doubt. But what I yeah. saw, I did like, I thought very much like you said, I mean, he didn't seem intimidated by any of the other drivers. And one thing I thought was a bit of a shame, he was in a bit of a scrap there with a Giovinazzi who was in the, uh, the, the Sauber and that just didn't really get to develop there. It looked like he was uh, maybe shaping up into something. And then Giovinazzi went into the pits to, uh, for his tire stop. And uh, well, of course, if you're Lance Stroll, you're happy because that's going to release you. And then you're looking up the road at the, the, the next car in front of you. But but yeah, I mean, give the guys some time and get him, give him a chance to get used not only to the car, but also to the tracks, because he's not going to be familiar with all of these ones. So we'll see how it goes over the next, uh, yeah, well, obviously, hopefully by the time we get halfway through the season, we should be able to get a good idea of, of how he's really adapted and, and fitting into Formula One. No, exactly. You mentioned Toro Rosso. I have to say, I like the new paint job. I yes. can't really like the Toro Rosso, that silver bull 
and the red stripe and the dark navy blue compared to the rebel which is black and the rebel logo i, I really like the toro rosso but mark i'm really happy in 2017 because all the things that i've been ranting about for the last year in the history of this show identity car scheme car schematic with the the paint scheme and all that we got a mclaren card it looks more like a mclaren card than a nondescript so that's one but force india taking literally the world of formula one by storm by painting their cars pink but having more coverage having more identity and probably fans than all their history combined with that move and this weekend it's a different game now like just the color of the car doesn't just change the performance it doesn't at all but it gives a identifiable characteristic to this team which makes them stand out which will make people gather make people flock towards that brand pink is the new silver (laughs) <laughs> isn't it really i mean i thought they looked uh, great the force indias and very much uh, to the toro rosos i mean obviously we know that they are basically the red bull b team but for too many years i've thought that there have been too similar looking the the the, the car so i was so happy to see them go with like the, the the different shade of blue and the silver bull on the side of the air box and i thought they looked great and that that pink on the force india i mean it really stands out i mean you you kind of think well this you know a, a lighter color like pink really going to show up all that difference on uh, different on the tv and the answer is yes and i thought they they looked like a a million bucks and it's nice to have each team have their own sort of specific identity and 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 really stand apart from one another because it gets up to be a little bit homogenous you know when you have so many cars that have very similar looking paint schemes and and just the layout on the car. So that's one thing that I thought uh, that just from an aesthetic point of view, just watching on TV, I thought looked uh, looked uh, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, me too. Uh, uh, one of the last points I have in this, uh, this race, Mark, uh, Renault, I-, I was expecting maybe more out of Renault. Uh, Julian Palmer was not lucky. He had problem with his engine, with his clutch and uh, with reliability. And 19, he did not finish the race and not finish uh, just, just a few laps. I think like not even half the race. I don't remember by heart. But Renault Oakenberg eleventh was not necessarily the best, but there's progress, and I do feel Renault will be a top ten team before long. Well, definitely. I mean, they do have the money and the resources to put into that team to develop it and become more competitive. They have a good driver in Nico Hulkenberg. I think that uh, Julian Palmer, I think there's obviously a lot of question marks uh, surrounding him. Uh, obviously, I think last year they had a, a fairly weak driver lineup with, with him and Kevin Magnussen. So Hulkenberg obviously adds a lot more credibility and adds uh, a lot more to the team. But yeah, I mean, disappointing from Hulk, but still a lot uh, that uh, that is to come. Uh, I mean, he wasn't the only one that was uh, back there, but I thought that uh, Esteban Ocon in the uh, the other Force India had a good race as well, and I thought that uh, eighth and ninth for the for the two Torosos uh, was uh, was pretty good as well, but. Just before we wrap it up uh, completely, we talked about the retirement of uh, Alonso. I thought that the, the attrition in this race was uh, fairly high. You had both Haases that didn't finish. You already mentioned uh, uh, Julian Palmer. Ericsson uh, was out. Uh, Danny Ricardo was out. And Lance Stroll was out. Uh, Kevin Magnussen was out. So there was about eight cars that re- retired in total for, for various reasons. And I think out of all of them, probably Danny Ricardo was probably probably the most upset i mean he had just a, a horrible weekend and i think that basically he started like what three laps two laps down yeah so two laps everybody well i mean of course he had the problem when he went off the track and qualifying and backed or drove yeah. his car backwards into the tire barrier then he had to end up so i mean happened. yeah like was a break his gearbox and the uh a piece next to the gearbox was literally impaled into the gearbox because of the accident so they yeah. had to the gearbox five points grid penalty and then you had some electrical problems and a whole lot of problems that had to do some work on 
and the car were not ready to start the actual race yesterday. That's right. So, I mean, the the one race out of the year, I think that if you're fortunate enough oh, to be oh. a Formula One driver and there is a Grand Prix in your home, like in your in your country, that's one race oh. that you obviously want to go out and do really well. So he must have been obviously quite upset that it didn't you know, go off. That's one of the reasons why you very rarely get an Australian winning their own Grand Prix because, well, it's the worst race in the season, especially when you change the rules and the the way the cars are built and put together. Like this year, you come to this race, like it's the unknown and you have the pressure of winning it at home on top of all the other thing. And you don't have luck on your side like Ricardo this time around. It's like everything worse could happen for him. Like had problem and then the engine just died 31 laps in and he's already lost an engine. Only three left. <laughs> Well, wow, that 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 was quick, eh? But I, I think that out of all the Australian race fans that were there, there was one Aussie that was particularly happy that Daniel Ricciardo yeah. did not finish and did not finish on the podium, and that was Mark Webber, who was the <laughs> MC on the podium at the end of the race because we all know what happened last year when Danny Ricciardo finished. Was it was it after Malay? No, it was in Spa at Spa when he forced Webber to do a shoey. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. it was not going to happen this time around. And Mark Webber interviewed his former teammate, Sebastian Vettel, which was not necessarily a very happy relationship at the end. Let's, let's just put it this way. Uh, Webber retired not because he was tired, but because he was he had enough of Sebastian Vettel, which was maybe a little younger. And I have no doubt to believe this. He'd be a little bit of a hothead back then. Yeah, that, that that could very well be. So I guess when it comes to a situation like that, you just got to put or let bygones be bygones and, and try and stay professional, eh? Oh, yeah, no, and it was well done. Mark Webber did what he had to do, asked a nice question to Sebastian Vettel, and you can it, it, hey, it's our first Ferrari victory of the history of Scuderia F1. This has to be a big deal. Like, it's the first Ferrari <laughs> win in a long, long time, and have to say, they were all up for it. Yeah, it's a combination of them, the right strategy that literally fell into their lap, and the maybe bad reaction, or maybe Hamilton's not, didn't save his tires properly, which led to him pitting a little bit, two, three laps earlier than he would have liked. Those two, three laps could maybe make that one or two second difference from Vettel's side, where if he didn't have those two, three laps, maybe he would not have enough of a gap to not do the overcut. So it's either a few things. That pit stop by Mercedes, the way Hamilton manages tires, it cost him a couple seconds, or because of the degradation of the tire, only for Hamilton though, because the rest of the field, the tires were awesome and the ultra soft stayed way longer and in a way better shape and a way better performance they're supposed to, especially on Danny Kvyat you do have the feeling that it's two, three seconds that were either lost by McLaren, by Mercedes or by Hamilton, but they were won by Vettel. Yeah. And that's all it really came down to at the end of the day. And just uh, before we sign off here, that don't you find that that combination on the podium of the German and the Italian national anthems, a real throwback <laughs> to, <laughs> to other days of Ferrari when, when Schumacher yeah. was, was the king of formula one and, and, you know nothing against uh, Sebastian, but every time uh, I hear that combination in in the podium ceremony, that kind of you know, takes me back to the uh, to the early parts of this uh, century. Can't say early part of this decade because it's been a while since Schumacher was driving for Ferrari. But that that Britain, definitely. Yeah. Is late something. 90s, literally late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's uh, that's it exactly. So we'll do it again in uh, in two weeks at at Shanghai. And the, the season is well underway now, so it's, it's great to finally be back. But before we go, Kevin, what's going on the network this week? You can stay tuned. The, the Soccer Today is live if you're listening to this Monday morning, 10 a.m. all week long. Soccer Today will be live at sportspodcastingnetwork.com, uh, Hardwood Radio, as well as League of Their Own podcast about the world of rugby with a Canadian team playing in England. Yes, exactly. And a lot, a lot more. And you can find all those shows at sportspodcastingnetwork.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Kev Laramie to always stay up to date. 
Very cool. And of course, if you want to follow this show on Twitter, it's fairly easy. And we are at Scuderia F1 Pod. And that's it. That's a wrap. We'll be back again later in this week with the news update. And the season is rocking and rolling, and we'll be here all year long. Anyways, on behalf of myself and Kevin, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again soon. Thanks for listening to the Scuderia F1 podcast. If you want to get the show notes for this episode, then head over to ScuderiaF1Pod.com. Want to get in touch with us? Then email us at ScuderiaF1Pod at gmail.com. You were listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us, sportspodcastingnetwork.com.com.